Hello everybody, this is Michael Bartlett here and today I'm going to be doing a short presentation on consulting in a complex world. So let's have a look at the agenda, it'll be nice and quick. First of all, we're going to talk about in the context of businesses, the difference between an ordered and a complex system. Then we're going to be looking at traditional consulting and the way that they approach consulting through these lenses. Then we're going to be looking at how we can become complexity conscious as consultants. The process that I'm going to outline, that includes the Estuarine framework, which was created by Dave Snowden. Safe to fail probes are the output of Estuarine mapping, so we'll talk a little bit about what those look like. And then finally, we'll look at something called proximate metrics, which is how we essentially monitor our safe to fail probes. So to get started, we need to make an important distinction between ordered and complex systems in relationship to the business world. So ordered systems are made from several known parts that interact with one another. They're normally engineered by human beings. They're predictable. So in that sense, we say they have reliable causality this part does this, this part does this. You can think about lots of examples now off the top of your head about how different components interact in different things that are manufactured or engineered by people. We can design solutions that will have a good chance of working if we understand the systems well enough. So let's take the iPhone for example. If they want to make an upgrade to the iPhone, they can be very confident that when they design for that, if they understand the system well enough, then they can go ahead and make those improvements and it's not going to result in catastrophe. Solutions tend to be flowchart or recipe based. So think about if you have a printer that's not working maybe in your home and you get on with the support team, typically there'll be a series of steps that you will walk through um, to try lots of different possibilities out. In that sense, because everything is bolted together and everything works in an orderly fashion, any solutions normally typically fall into simple flowcharts that one follows or even simple recipes. And a great distinction between ordered and complex is ordered systems can be taken apart and then put, to, put back together again and continue to function. So a great example of this is a bicycle. Think about taking a bicycle apart into its different pieces and then you put them back together again and it carries on just as it was before. And so I've included that in my example. So examples of ordered systems, bicycles, motor vehicles, iPhone and an espresso machine. Complex systems, however, are a little different. So they are made from several parts as well, but these parts are independent and entangled agents that interact with one another. And in a complex system, relationships and interactions are far more important than the actual components themselves. They're normally created by nature or they involve humans interacting. And what I mean by that is, yes, they're normally created by nature, but sometimes a person or a number of people might create a complex system. So for example, let's say in your business you've got a, a group of people and you, you call them the culture committee. Well, the culture committee is created by people, but because it involves humans interacting, it's still classed as a complex system. And they can only be understood retrospectively. We cannot know what will happen next. So here's a really good example. Think about in your business, uh, let's say you look at the meeting calendar and you see that there's a meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. and a number of individuals are scheduled to be in that meeting. You cannot predict with certainty if those people will even show up. And even if they do show up, you cannot predict with certainty the exact conversation that's going to take place. It's unpredictable. It's, there's just too many variables at play. And so with a complex system, when we want to make changes to them or interventions, we design for direction and emergence. And there's never a guarantee of success. Solutions should be monitored and adjusted as necessary. And unlike the previous type of system we talked about, these guys cannot be taken apart and then put back together again and expected to function. Think about doing that to a frog. That's not going to end very well. And the same applies to cities, to culture, to immune systems. You know, businesses, of course, it goes without saying, are also complex systems. So traditional consulting operates in the mindset that we are dealing with ordered systems. 
And that's why you end up with quotes like this. Let me tell you our secret sauce. Our clients already know what they want to do. We just give them permission to act and they pay us handsomely for it. Yeah, that is a quote from a CEO of a successful company and the quote was made to me directly over lunch and I could not believe what I was hearing. But unfortunately, that is how a lot of consulting is starting to go these days. So traditional consulting treats businesses as ordered systems. That means they tend to focus on mission statements and visions rather than a sense of direction. Because again, they think they can control the future. They can predict the future and they take the recipe approach. So they'll typically come in with model X or model Y. A good example of this is the Boston box. You can Google that if you want to know what that is, but it's a very popular model used by the Boston consulting group. Um, they'll say, well, this worked for client A, so it will work for client B. Um, they'll tell them what they want to hear and then rinse and repeat, as you saw with the quote. The other thing they'll do, and you don't even need a consultant for this, businesses do this on their own as well, is they'll create what we call a thousand stupid rules in order to give themselves the illusion of creating order. Uh, so a thousand stupid rules is a phrase that I adopted uh, from a company called The Ready. <clears throat> and they talk about basically creating organizational debt. And that's one way that businesses try to give themselves a sense of control and a sense that they can predict the future is by just layering in as many policies and rules as they can. But of course, that actually can lead to disaster. So we really need, as both businesses and consultants, to become more complexity conscious. So how do we do that? Well, becoming complexity conscious involves treating businesses as they are, which is as complex systems. This means we focus on a sense of direction rather than trying to control all of the outcomes and focusing on mission statements and vision. So we take an emergent approach. So we try to understand the patterns of each unique business. Then we create small initiatives that tell us about what works and what doesn't. We make the energy cost of sin higher than the energy cost of virtue. I borrowed that from Dave Snowden. And essentially what that means is in any system, you're typically going to take the path of least resistance because even though businesses aren't living, breathing organisms, they still behave in the same way. And so, and of course they're composed of human beings as well, which of course we do do that. And it's in our interest to always be lazy to use the least amount of energy to get the optimal result. And so when you make these tweaks and these interventions in a complex system, one of the ways to be successful is if you find something that you don't want to happen, then you just make the energy costs of doing that higher and higher until people no longer take that route. And then we also engage in vigilant simplification. This is one of the best ways to free the organization and to free it of organizational debt. We don't want to put people into analysis paralysis where there's so many friggin' rules, I don't know what's going on. People become scared to act because they don't want to make a mistake and then fall foul of one of these rules. You obviously don't want a free for all because then that's no longer even considered a complex system. That's a disordered system. No one knows what's happening. There's no constraints. There's no boundary. So there needs to be some, but kind of like, you know, the American mentality, which as a Brit I do share, I take the same approach to systems as I do to government, which is it should be uh, small and just need to do its job. We don't need any of this overreaching, which causes more problems than, uh, than good in the long run. So if you're still struggling with the idea of a business being a complex system, let me introduce um, an idea here that will help. So, and we can use this diagram here on the left. I want you to imagine a table with several magnets on it. So in this case, these magnets are the large purple cylindrical shapes that you can see that have been placed. Now, some of these you can control the polarity. So let's imagine you've got some buttons and you can control whether they're going to be very positive or very negative and the strength. Some people uh, control these magnets that you know, but there's also some people that you don't know about that control these magnets as well. So you can see how this could get a little messy. Now the movement of these metal pieces, you know, you see these nuts and bolts on the table. These can be predicted when there are one or two magnets. But once you reach three or more magnets, 
you cannot predict what is going to happen. You actually end up pushing what would have been an ordered system into a complex system. So this is a great example of understanding how one can become the other. And this is known in physics as the three-body problem. So if you take the moon rotating around the Earth, rotating around the sun, you might think they follow very, very specific laws of physics, and it's 100% entirely predictable. But unfortunately, because each has an effect on the other, once you reach three, it becomes unpredictable. You can get within a certain level of accuracy, but no one can get 100% accurate on predicting that movement. And so the three-body problem essentially is the, the foundation of the idea of complexity. So this essentially now you can think of as your business, this metaphor here. So the magnets are what we call modulators of the system. So they affect the movement of the materials on the table. You will have modulators in your business that affect the behaviors and the movements within your business. So there'll be many modulators within a business and they will contribute to patterns of observable effects or outcomes, if you will. So what we need to do is we need to seek to dampen the modulators that contribute to undesirable patterns and amplify the ones that contribute to desirable patterns. And changes that we make should be small and safe to fail. We don't want to cause a catastrophe while we're in the process of trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. So that's why when we take Dave Snowden's approach to complexity theory, which is the, the one that we're going to see now with the SGI mapping in a moment, the general idea is the safe to fail. Very, very small, low budget, little experiments that prove that we can nudge in the right direction. So in essence, when we try to think about consulting in a complex world, the best way to sum it up is we help business owners learn to dance with reality and create favorable conditions for positive emergence. So traditional consultants might say that, you know, working on a business is like driving a car. You know, you have certain levers, you have certain pedals, you do certain things, you know, you put certain inputs into the system, you're going to get certain outputs. We don't see it that way. We see it's more like learning to ride an elephant. And so even if you are the most experienced person at riding an elephant, you still have to understand you don't really control it. There's a relationship there and you're just trying to help make it do the things that you want it to do. But it's never actually going to work out 100% perfectly, but you can get better and better and better the more experienced you get, the more little things you try out here and there. And the image of the gardener, I've really put that there because if we think about culture, for example, culture isn't a problem that needs to be solved. This is a great misnomer in the world. Culture is something that needs to be cultivated. And so when you take your approach to a business as a complex system, all the so-called problems that you see really are emergent phenomena. And so what you need to learn to do is to cultivate the right conditions to create the right outcomes that you want to see. So here's an overview of the process that I'm going to be recommending that we use. So we're going to begin with the gather phase. So what we do is we gather narratives from the employee base and those will illuminate both positive and negative patterns. And they may even possibly illuminate some of the modulators as well. Because normally when you talk to an employee about, you know, what's working, what's not working in organization, sometimes they will venture a causality statement like, well, I think this is kind of what's causing it. And so we need to gather as many of those narratives as we can. Then we sit down with the executive team and we map those. So we brainstorm from all of those narratives what the modulators might be and we map those onto a graph which uh, is done using the Estuarine framework which we'll talk about next. Then when we've done that we identify the leverage points. So these are the modulators that are candidates for change and the, they also priority for the business. Then we go ahead and we create our safe to fail probes and we run them concurrently things aren't working we remove them things are working then of course we seek to increase them you know make those smaller projects into bigger projects and the final stage is we just monitor we monitor using proximate metrics which we'll talk about at the end of this presentation and human human sensor networks which essentially means we put people in the business out there in the field looking at the business from different angles to try and see what's working and what's not working and to report back on any you know, any phenomena that looks like it could be a, a, an emerging problem that the business isn't aware of yet. I found that businesses sometimes tend to disregard something if it happens once or it happens once or twice um, in something that fits a preconceived notion they have of the business. Uh, but sometimes those things can be weak signals of a much bigger problem brewing. 
And that's why we want to try to make sure that we listen to everybody's perspective and we really mine for those weak signals. So we're going to talk about the estuarine framework next. So let me talk about why this thing even exists. So the idea is that we, Dave Snowden came up with the estuarine framework and it follows the metaphor of an estuary, which has many, many different flows through. An estuary, for those who don't know, is the point at which a river meets the sea. And so you kind of have you know fresh water mixing with salt water. You have a lot of movement, a lot of things changing. It's a very, very good metaphor for a business. And so it was developed as a counter to traditional approaches to strategy that are very fixed in nature. And it reflects the key principles of change in a complex environment. Some of the items might be stable, for example, like a granite cliff, while others like sandbanks could shift daily. And as the water flows in and out, some elements might be covered or visible. And you can see, of course, how this relates to the business. You know, some states in the business, you might have some behaviors that go below the surface. And then when those states change, then those behaviors pop up again. And so there, there are definitely a lot of moving parts and it can uh, become very, very overcomplicated if you take an ordered systems approach. But thankfully, we have this framework, so we have a way of approaching this now. So here's what the estuarine framework looks like. It essentially uses um, a graph to map out the energy to change uh, and the time to change. And so we map our modulators on there. And the idea is we try to figure out how much energy or time it would take to make a difference to one of those modulators, to change it, to make it, you know, take more energy or take, you know, more time or less in either case. So the items in the top right cannot really be changed. So uh, those things are pretty fixed, like the granite cliffs that we mentioned earlier. Um, the items in the liminal zone are changeable, but not really by the people doing the mapping. So that's where you might have to go to another you know, third party or a higher authority to try to see if those things could be changed. So they're less likely. Um, and then we've got this item in the bottom left here. Now, these items are very volatile. These are targets for actions aiming to stabilize or increase the energy of the time and uh, energy around them. Um, so essentially what it does is it contains them. Um, and you know you might have volatile elements in your business that could be very dangerous and have high impact. So you immediately would want to look at those. But then everything else in the middle, those are the candidates for change. Those are going to be the candidates for your safe to fail probes. So safe to fail probes are about producing observable benefits through failure. So what we will do is for each modulator, we will ask what can we change, and then from that set, we will ask where can we monitor the impact of change and also where can we readily amplify success or dampen failure we need to think small and local with questions like well what might happen if we need to think about effort and motivation we need to think about tweaking constraints incentives and rules and the best way really uh, that I've seen it recommends using groups of trios. So you divide the room into groups of three, and then you have one group look at certain probes, one group look at another group of probes, and then you rotate them, and then they can give feedback uh, to each other's possible intervention ideas. And then finally, once we've got the probes, we want to think about the metrics. And here's why. Chicago Public Schools, there was an intervention designed to reduce the dropout rate. However, the problem is you can't wait a whole year to see if the intervention was successful. And because of the way that dropout rates tend to work, you can't even monitor it over time and compare it to last year or the year before because you may suddenly get sudden spikes. So you really need a way of approximating whether or not you're going in the right direction. And this is where proximate metrics come from. So you look at what short term measures could be examined and what is our theory of change? Right, what do we think is causing this overall needle to move? And then are there any smaller things that we can look at? And so in the case of Chicago Public Schools, they found that, well, it's not so much they found, they had the theory of change that, well, if we can boost attendance and if we can boost grades, we believe that correlates to the chances of someone graduating. So we're going to use those two short-term metrics. 
Now, we need to safeguard our metrics. So there's a number of thought experiments that you can do when you're in the process of creating these. As a group, run the misalignment test. So you imagine that the metrics do not predict success accurately. Okay, well then what would allow us to sniff out that misalignment as early as possible? And what alternative measures might provide potential replacements? The lazy bureaucrat test. If someone wanted to succeed in this metric with the least effort possible, what would they do? This helps you sniff out potential gaming of the metric. The unintended consequences test. Well, what if we succeed yet cause negative unintended consequences that outweigh the value of our work? What should we be paying attention to that might contribute to this? And then the dark modulators test. Imagine we succeed. But what else might explain the success other than our own efforts? I.e., could everything we have done actually have done nothing? Something else was causing the success. Could those things exist, brainstorm them, and then ask, are we tracking those factors? So in summary, by recognizing businesses as complex systems, consultants can help leadership teams to understand the patterns and behaviors that flow through their organizations. This ultimately leads to clearer decisions, better outcomes, and happier and healthier organizations moving, of course, in the right direction. So thanks for your time today. Please contact me if you have any questions.